Welcome back, everybody, and good afternoon. I know a number of people have joined us, and there are some watching online. And so I wanted to say again that I am Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and we're delighted to have all of you here with us on the occasion of both the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve opening its doors for business, and also the 100th anniversary of public policy at the University of Michigan, the Ford School Centennial. Um, well, today's keynote speaker is Betsy Stevenson, who is a highly accomplished economist who is currently on leave from the University of Michigan, serving as a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, and I'm really proud and honored to have her as a member of the Ford School faculty. She previously served as chief economist at the Labor Department and a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research, um, an affiliate there. Her widely read research and public discussions on the impact of public policies on the labor market have been um, well recognized and have had a large policy impact as well, and I know that's one of the topics that she is spending some of her time at the CEA looking at. And she has focused extensively on the role of data subjective well-being, and in a variety of other areas as well for how we think about public policy. Um, her topic today, as you'll learn more about in just a few moments, is the role of research for the Council of Economic Advisors, and that seems a particularly appropriate topic given the broader context of our conference. I did want to mention that we have set aside a little bit of time for questions following her remarks. And if you have questions, we do have staff who can bring you a microphone. Please wait for the microphone. And for those of you who are watching online, I invite you to tweet your questions. Please use the hashtag FordSchoolGramlick, and one of our staff will read your questions uh, to our speaker. And with no further ado, it is my great pleasure to invite Betsy Stevenson to the podium. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a tremendous uh, pleasure to be here. And um, I was uh, just saying to Marina, she was asking how I was liking the world of, uh, of uh, the Council of Economic Advisors. And it is one of the most uh, thrilling, exciting places I've ever been. And I think part of that is the fact that I have to move so rapidly from very, very disparate issues. Um, and that is both uh, its challenge and its its excitement. So what I wanted to do was to take this talk as a chance to step back a little bit and think about the role of the Council of Economic Advisors. And um, it gave me an excuse to read um, what a lot of former CEA chairs have written about the Council of Economic Advisors. And um, you know, I, I thought after I'd read it that um, it was both very helpful um, and I was somewhat glad I hadn't read it right before I came in. Um, <laughs> Because uh, I think it's it's allowed uh, it it allowed me to go in with with fresh thinking, um, and uh, um, but I think there's some ways in which they all paint the same picture. And without having read their pieces, I would have said uh, the exact same things that they said, in the sense that um, they also paint the same picture of the council as providing. Uh, the president and senior officials with objective advice based on the principles and tools of economics. The other thing I found really interesting is that many of them mentioned the fact that the Council of Economic Advisors looks after the national interests by considering how policy impacts societal welfare in a process dominated by the views of interests usually called special interests, and many remarked how the Council of Economic Advisors' special interest was the national interest. Uh, what I found interesting about this is that um, it helped me understand, actually, why I sometimes face challenges in my job that I hadn't quite recognized before, um, because uh, it always seems obvious to me that the national interest is the interest, um, and I am learning uh, over time that there are, are many interests, but I, I fully uh, stand behind the job of the Council of Economic Advisors as, rec as uh, trying to figure out what is uh, really the best thing to do in terms of maximizing societal welfare. So that description of the council remains true nearly 20 years later. And of course, many of you I know have actually spent time at the council 
Um, so this, the structure has really stayed the same. You know, the, the council is comprised of a chair and two members, uh, senior, senior sta uh, staff of senior economists, professional statisticians, a director of forecasting, and many junior economists. Um, the council members and senior economists typically come for a short spell in government from academia or a think tank, a model that um, former chair Joe Stiglitz described as citizen bureaucrats. Um, while sometimes clunky, this citizen bureaucrat model does facilitate the council's role as an effective conduit between the research community and the policymaking process. And the council continues to elevate decisions or to evaluate decisions in terms of the overall impact on, on welfare. So what has changed? I think the biggest thing that's changed is technology. And that's not just a change in the council, rather that's the broader change that we've seen in our profession. And the council has, uh, of course, reflected this change. The economics profession is in the midst of a revolution. We're becoming a more empirical field. Rather than just theorize about the effects of policy, we turn to hard data to tell us about how the world really works. Um, this revolution is the result of a technological change that's given us an explosion of data and, importantly, the computing power with which to analyze it. In short, there are now opportunities to analyze public policy in a way that our predecessors could have only dreamed about. These opportunities make academic research more connected to reality and policy. In turn, our deeper connection to reality makes us as economists more accessible, more relevant, and actually more central to the policy debate. Implicit in this shift is the hope that empirical evidence will improve our understanding of government programs and the economy. Now, while this change is impacting all of economics, I think it's a particular boom for microeconomics. And in reading um, many of the reviews of what the council has done, micro has sort of been, um, shall we say, the Cinderella uh, uh, in the family. The, um, and I say Cinderella on purpose as in the sort of ignored stepchild um, who I think is rising uh, in prominence with our ability to do more analysis. Now, hopefully many of you will, will disagree with that and say that the former chairs had a bias when they wrote up their reviews of the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and, uh, but I, I do think that what definitely uh, has occurred is a notable shift in the, in, in the amount of applied work that we're doing. Um, the work and the staff of the council has shifted along with the economics profession. Our junior economists are no longer only advanced graduate students, but include computer savvy undergraduate economics majors following the full-time RA model that many empirically oriented economists are using to crunch literally millions of data points. And our staff economists have noted ruefully that they are expected to conduct research at the council that a few decades ago would have easily earned them their dissertation. And now they're expected to do it in a few short weeks, a month or two if they're lucky. They're also, uh, this, uh, this type of sophisticated analysis of large scale data sets in uh, brief time uh, is I think one of the advantages for graduate students of spending time at the council. Not only are you exposed to an enormous range of ideas, but you actually learn how to get them done and get them done quickly. Um, the explosion of empirical economics has also increased the number of competing analysis that are relevant to any particular public policy pro uh, problem. And this, this explosion represents both an opportunity and a caution for policymakers and the public. The caution is becoming obvious. There are conflicting studies on many important policy issues. And um, the, I think we see this across a range of fields, not just economics. Um, in a field where I know very little, health, I'm still confused about whether coffee is good for me or not good for me, given the number of studies that come out. And so the most important advice for policymakers is to understand that a given research result should not be thought of as either right or wrong, but as a guide that should shift one's thinking. The question is how far? We're in formal Bayesians, and to us, the CEA, the question of how far to shift our views depends on both the precision of our priors, that is, how much we already knew about the issues, and the precision of the new signal, 
which is largely shaped by your interpretation of the credibility of the research design. The challenge for the council and for others trying to inform policymakers about research is that policymakers tend not to be Bayesians. The council's job is therefore to bring Bayesian updating to policymakers. The opportunity is that the proliferation of studies truly does improve the evidence base available to us, making it easier for us to make the case that policy should be guided by robust research. For the Council of Economic Advisors, the explosion in empirical research and the tools available to scholars has deepened our role, I believe, as a conduit of research to white, uh, of research to white House senior advisors and to the president. So let me turn now to giving you some concrete examples of what CEA does and how I think this revolution has changed or caused us to tweak a little bit about what we do. So the CEA, as many of you know, is required by statute to write an economic report of the president each year. And what it says in the statute is that that report should set forth current and foreseeable trends in the levels of employment, production, and purchasing power, and a program for carrying out the policy to promote conditions under which there will be afforded useful employment for those able, willing, and seeking to work. So in most years that I have looked through, the ERP has attempted to do more than that. Um, and has attempted to be broader and to speak more to the broader policy debate that is going on. In, uh, I think one of the things that's changed is that the rapid timeline under which things are moving and the technology available to us means that we can release reports on a more timely basis and feed into the policy making process uh, in a way that provides more timely analysis on economic policy. So we've recently begun to reconsider how we should best produce the economic report. And if you look at the most, the 2014 economic report of the president, you'll notice that several of the chapters had been previously released as reports that fed into a more timely aspect of where the policy cycle was. I think the, you know, the ERP to me serves two really important roles. One is it provides a record for what the, what the administration was thinking and doing at the time, but it also provides, it also feeds into real-time policy process. And uh, this uh, more continuous model of releasing chapters, I believe, uh, better serves that latter purpose. Um, so to give you a, an example of one of those chapters, this past January marked the 50th anniversary of the announcement of the War on Poverty, something Sheldon made sure I understood clearly as I went to the, uh, the council this past summer. Um, and walking into the council with a, a president who was interested in thinking about poverty and inequality, um, we saw one of our jobs as making sure that senior advisors understood that there was a broader historical framework to think about and that uh, there would be questions naturally raised as we got closer to that anniversary about how, how good of a job has our government programs done. Now, the challenge that we faced is that you'd think that 50 years later it would be an easy question to answer whether or not uh, our government policies have uh, reduced or not succeeded in reducing poverty. It turns out that is not actually an easy question to answer. Um, it's not easy uh, for... Um, what is either a simple or um, uh, arcane, perhaps, reason, which is that our official poverty measure excludes almost every poverty-fighting program that we have. <laughs> so if you look at the official poverty rate and use that as a tool to measure uh, or as a statistic to measure our tools in fighting poverty, you're um, failing to understand that that measure, in fact, excludes our, our very tools. So uh, CEA, what we really wanted was, was something that seemed like a simple concept. What would m poverty be if there was no government, market-based poverty? And what is poverty once we put the government programs on top? And we turned to uh, our staff. We worked with our senior economists. We said, how are we going to answer this question? Very, very smart senior economist who graduated from the Ford School, uh, Jordan Matsudera, said, I cannot answer this question on my own in the next couple of months. This is a big idea question. And he went out and canvassed and talked to 
academics who worked on this issue. And he discovered a team of academics who were trying to met, extend the supplemental poverty measure, which does more to include our, our policy programs uh, in, in it as a measure back in time. But Jordan said to them, that's great. I'm really glad you're doing this work. The problem is if we want to say something about how effective our programs are over time, supplemental poverty measure is quasi-relative. So as you extend it back in time, you're shifting the goalpost. And if I use your measure to compare how poverty, uh, this me as measured by the SPM, uh, is today compared to 50 years ago, I'm still going to get something that doesn't tell me did our programs work or not. So he worked with them and came up with the idea of creating an anchored version of the SPM that's not quasi-relative. We, uh, these researchers came in and presented to the overall administration. They worked with our team. And uh, they released a paper that I hope they felt was better targeted at how they could influence the policy debate. And we released a chapter which was able to explicitly try to answer the question of how much has uh, public policies reduced poverty. And we were able to release that in time for the 50th anniversary so we could feed directly into the debate that was that was ongoing. Um, that is, a, I, I think, you know, a great model. And let me say that was one of the things we did where we did actually spend months doing it, not weeks doing it. Um, but we still spend, you know, way less time than uh, academics would typically spend. Let me give you um, one other example that I think really illustrates um, the modern era of economics. The policy team and senior officials inside the administration were grappling with whether the president should raise the minimum wage for federal contractors. And there were a lot of questions. What would happen if we raised the minimum wage for federal contractors? How would this impact employment? How would this impact productivity? Um, what do we, how would it impact the cost to the taxpayer? And I think, why I think this example really illustrates the modern era is because, of course, the first thing we did is what CEA would have always done. We canvassed the literature. And we had uh, many people who were reading, you know, a full range of literature, not just on, you know, minimum wage changes, living wage ordinances, changes in uh, contr federal contracting pay, and providing a summary of what, are, what do we know. We took a look at, in terms of the employment effects, at um, all of the many, many studies that uh, had been done to sort of see where does the literature seem to suggest what are the employment effects from raising the minimum wage. And then we did our own empirical research. It turns out there's federal dollars spent in every single state, and every state has raised its minimum wage. What happened to spending on procurement in each state as they raised their minimum wage? Now's where I talk about something that not that long ago would have get, helped someone uh, make progress on their dissertation. I know, a very nice piece of work which showed that there was zero effect on procurement costs in a state following its rate increase in the minimum wage. So uh, uh, that um, pulling together existing research, doing our own primary research, um, and doing our own detective work in the data, one thing I should mention is that a natural question you might have is how many people are there working for federal contractors who are in the minimum wage? That data doesn't actually exist. We don't collect that data. Um, so that's when I talk about data detective work, developing models, um, and looking at uh, downloading federal contracts and trying to figure out what kind of work these people do what city they're in, and what's the likelihood that they're being paid the minimum wage given other people doing that kind of work in that kind of town. Um, the, the, I, this sort of overall analysis, doing primary research, investigating um, the current research, this is the kind of thing that I think is really only possible in the modern era where data, millions of data points are at our fingertips, computing tool, enormous amounts of computing power are at our fingertips. And frankly, our students have all been better trained coming out of undergraduate programs, coming out of MPP programs, uh, coming out of, you know, first or second year graduate school to use empirical, pro to use a econometric program to, to do the kind of analysis to help us shed light on these issues. Now, 
beyond these issues that are directly feeding into policy decisions, the Council keeps abreast of the new economic literature for topics that might be important for policymaking in the future and where the profession stands on critical issues. Maintaining a close connection to academia is useful here too as we're able to offer advice on new policy suggestions that is grounded in cutting edge work. For instance, we're you know, regularly finding, looking at what is the new, latest working paper coming out of the NBER and uh, is there information in there that we want to make sure policymakers know about, not related to any particular policy, but just in the back of their head as they're trying to understand uh, how the world is changing. We also invite prominent scholars to discuss their work um, and in recent weeks have enjoyed sessions with uh, Tomas Piketty, Bob Hall, Atif Mian, Amir Sufi to discuss their prominent work in person. And I think it's really important to emphasize that the White House is always interested in policy recommendations even if they can't be readily implemented because policy ideas that may seem unrealistic at first can, uh, uh, the policy recommendations that flow out of research can eventually become common sense approaches, uh, approach, common sense approaches to policy. Um, so for instance, as many others uh, have noted, tradable permits and spectrum auctions were once only academic exercises and the Council of Economic Advisors was at the forefront of saying, no, these may actually be real life policy solutions. Uh, by continuously beating that drum, the world uh, eventually uh, moved towards that. The, uh, um, I, I think the, you know, the, the other thing that's happening is, of course, as the world is changing, there is greater um, potential value and certainly greater opportunity for CEA to engage not only with inside the administration, but to engage with policymakers outside the administration and to reach reach a more general audience, whether it's journalists or influential advocacy groups. Um, and so CEA now engages talking to the broader public much more directly. And I think, again, technology holds the key. Um, we're making fuller use of a moder modern media platforms. Uh, both Jason and I have Twitter accounts. Um, and uh, and I, I have uh, many times after the employment report was released, uh, whatever way we possibly can. Now, the the last thing I, I wanted to say, um, and and I think that uh, th this is important for people who take a look at the empirical revolution in economics and sometimes mistakenly think that the shift toward a more empirically grounded economics means theory is less important. Um, and I think this is just wrong. Uh, and so I always, when I talk about this, want to make sure that I have a chance to get that out. Because what I think has happened instead is not that theory is less important, but that the role of theory has changed. When facts were rare, we used theory to fill in for facts. Today, facts are abundant. We have too many facts, and we use theory to help us weed out facts um, and to give us a set of tools to identify empirical research uh, results that are unlikely to be true. So let's return uh, to the example of research on the minimum wage. Um, when I said uh, you know, that we took a look at as many of the results in the literature that we can, I think one of the, uh, the lesson for how theory weeds out facts is really apparent when you look at a scatter plot of the impact of the minimum wage on employment because it has a huge left tail and no right tail. And uh, you know, this is evidence of publication bias. It's probably sensical publication bias. If I produce a result that tells you that the greatest way I can in increase employment in my community would be to raise the minimum wage, um, and that would ha enormously boost employment, no journal editor is likely to believe that uh, is true. Now, if instead I produce a result that says the you know, minimum wage has a negative impact on employment, those results are more likely to end up getting published. But I think uh, this, again, reminds us of the role of the council and, and, and other academics with inside government, uh, other uh, economists and empirical researchers at reminding people, uh, again, about that Bayesian updating, thinking about what are the results you have in front of you um, and what they mean. And every time we 
uh, as a CEA, produce that scatter plot, I always get a, a few people on Twitter who say to me, but yes, look at all the, there's still all these negative effects on employment. Look at these estimates on the left-hand side, and there's none on the right-hand side. Um, and it, it's, it's useful to understand uh, that those are, have been sensibly, I think, weeded out. But I think, uh, in addition to thinking about the fact that observations are, are thrown away um, because of the fact that they don't match our theory, I think that the more important or, or perhaps most important uh, role now uh, in interaction between theory and empirics is the growth of behavioral economics. Because uh, you know, the, the growth of behavioral economics depended on data to reveal to economists and psychologists the systematic ways in which people make mistakes. Without evidence, economists had known that people make mistakes. I think sometimes people forget this. Economists did know people made mistakes. <laughs> um, we just assumed these mistakes were random, and we didn't have any reason to believe that they were systematic. And so on average, people made calculated rational decisions. What data is helping us understand is that there are ways in which people make systematic mistakes. And this, uh, this revolution in theory coming out of the revolution in empirical science, I think, is very important for uh, policymakers and something uh, for that CEA needs to uh, help policymakers understand what does this mean? Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, what does this mean and what is the role of policy in helping people in particular areas where we now know that they make mistakes? Um, and I think this has opened up a whole new type of research for us to be paying attention to and a whole new way for us to be thinking um, about how we can inform the policy process. So let me uh, conclude by saying um, you know, that this administration, and, and I always, I should say, it's really the only one I know because I am kind of young, <laughs> um, uh, is really has been dedicated uh, to building a smarter, more innovative, more accountable government, and uh, has been focused on integrating research into policy. In fact, I, I just left a meeting where uh, the President of the United States attended and one of the cabinet members talked very excitedly about working with the chief statistician of the United States to make sure that you know, was, we were going to get the data that we needed. Um, and so these, this idea that we have to know what we're trying to do and be able to measure it is at every level of government now. And many agencies and offices in the White House including the Council of Economic Advisors, are helping to make research more prominent in the minds um, of policymakers and helping to set an evidence-based agenda to improve governance performance. The Council's role in this is a continuation of a long-standing model that's been successful across many administrations. And while our approach is changing somewhat with the times, the fundamental goal looking out for the national interest by bringing rigorous economic thinking to matters of national importance is uh, resolute. The re revolution in economics has increased both the opportunity and the challenges for economists and policy, and the Council of Economic Advisors is happily embracing both. I have a question that has some, uh, uh, it's a little unfair, it's self-interest, but it, it seemed to me, first of all, there's a meeting about policy and academia and bridging that gap, as Ned Gramlich did better than anyone I know. But you said a, a couple things about uh, policy that I'm not sure we prepare our students for namely the use of simula uh, simulation and simulation techniques and also behavioral economics. So when you come back in a year, uh, would you have an interest or <laughs> would, you, would you recommend that maybe econ departments and policy schools begin to train people to use those tools? Um, you know, I, I, uh, I think that that is a great question and it, it um, I do think that if we think about the revolution in empirical 
economics and what it means for policymakers, it does have implications for how we train students and the types of skills we need them to have. Um, you know, at, at its core, a grounding in economic theory is essential. You know, we, if you're going to be an economist advising uh, in policymakers or playing uh, a role in economic policy, you need to understand the role of incentives. That hasn't changed, and that's been true in, you know, since 19, before the council was uh, uh, set in place in 1946. But there is the sense in which, you know, our, our, it is, our theories are changing, um, our understanding of the ways in which people make mistakes are changing, and mistakes, people making systematic mistakes is perhaps, you know, if, if I think about where, where is the role of government greatest, it's where there's market failure, um, asymmetric information. You know, we, we, when the market's doing well, the market's doing well, when people are making mistakes, are there things we can do to help them make fewer mistakes? And when there's problems with information, are there things we can do to remove those blockages? When, uh, and, and we certainly, I think that is the direction in which we should be making sure our students are trained to focus on why, why is there a role for government? What is, you know, what is different from, if, what would happen if there was no government? Um, and to do that today, I think we do need to have a grounding in the types of uh, mistakes people make. And then the tools to be able, as you said, to, to turn to the data and to consider you know, potential counterfactuals and to think of the most creative way to say, if we enact this policy, what do I think is likely to happen? I don't know. Jim, you can. <laughs> I'll chat. Uh, you know, are you at all concerned that the uh, empirical, you know, it sounds terrific with a more empirically based, you know, policy analysis and randomized controlled trials, um, but the most obvious application for those are on short run reactions and short run problems. What if we're, does it mean that uh, we have less emphasis maybe, or, or how do we take that method and apply it to the long run issues, you know, like deficits that go on 20 years, environmental degradation, global warming, changes in income distribution over long periods of time. How do we, can we, does it apply to that as well or is it mostly kind of short term things? And if it isn't the long term things, then how do we address those analytically, those long run problems? Um, so, you know, that I, I actually spend a lot of time trying to think about this because if you, I do think one of the important roles of the Council of Economic Advisors is that because we don't, we're all going back to our academic jobs. And, and I should have said, you know, I do think this is actually, many for other people have pointed this out, but this idea that in some sense we really don't care what people think of us because we have a real job to go back to is actually what one of the things that gives us a degree of like independence that's kind of important. Um, you know, there's not the... Yeah, there's not career positioning. It's all fun, and when it's not, you know, you can take your ball and bat and go home. Um, and the, you know, so the council thinks a lot about long run. And um, I, I'm an applied microeconomist, and I actually spend a lot of time thinking about long run. And, it, and in fact, but I think that there are things we learn from the empirical data that can help inform us about long run issues. Um, I will say that uh, um, there is empirical work on this relationship between debt and growth. Uh, little uh, that you know, I think is very interesting and should actually inform policymakers. We won't dig into that, but um, it's not like those issues don't have empirical research. The but for things that I think about, because I focus mostly on social policy, you know, I think that we have a couple of big opportunities for long run growth ahead of us right now. Um, one of them is doing more to promote uh, minority men in the labor market. And I think that that's grounded in empirical research, which shows that when we invest more in preschool, in boys in preschool, um, they end up uh, having better performance, being more likely to work in the labor force. Um, someone, an academic, so we had a bunch of academics to talk about work family issues in with senior officials um, just this week, and one of them told me about a study that showed that you can see the effects of paid uh, maternity leave on the wages of children 
whose mom stayed home at age 30. So I, I haven't looked up the paper, but I like was it, it's on my list of things to do this weekend because you know, you so you can look for empirical results, and what we have to do is then say, well, what does this mean for the long run? I I think that you know it is important that we keep asking that question, and I think the nature of the council is designed to think about the long run. But for me, I think. You know, if you look at women's labor force participation, I think it uh, was the growth in women's labor force participation was extremely important for economic growth in the last half of the 20th century. And what we do to support it in this century is going to be important for long run economic growth. It's in the you know, same thing for minority men. Um, immigration is something where we think a lot about what's the effect of that on long run growth. So I do think that there is, you know, a role to aggregate up the micro results and ask what do they mean for the long run. Jesse, um, <clears throat> having been on a member, a member of the CEA more than 40 years ago, I was fascinated by your account of how things have changed um, over that period, both for the CEA and for our profession. And I hardly endorse what you said at the beginning about the mission of the CEA. But and I would include paying attention to the long run. Mm. But there's one thing you didn't mention. And this is something that was one, first raised to me by Walter Heller and that since then I've thought a lot about. And that is another goal, which is to some extent in tension with all the ones you mentioned. And that is that when all is said and done and the internal fights have been won or lost by the CEA, you are also the defenders of the administration's economic policy. And there certainly times do arise when that defense is not exactly congruent with the best possible advice you might give as an economist. And I wondered if that had yet concerned you and how you would deal with it. Um. Well, see, one of the ways I dealt with it was I didn't address it today. <laughs> I find that things aren't nice to talk about. We just don't talk about. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's, that's obviously true. I mean, nobody labors under the impression that uh, it wouldn't make sense for the president and senior advisors to take the advice of the economists all the time because we should not be giving advice that makes any, that, that is conditional on making political sense. We should give the best economic advice. And sometimes that advice is ridiculous given the political situation. And so it's obviously not going to be taken all the time. Um, and also, as you said, there are, you know, people have differing views. I think that it's important that we continue to give, you know, the, um, you know, that we continue to just give the best advice that we can and to look for. Uh, you know, and to follow the policy, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. <laughs> um, I guess the one last thing I'll say on that is I, I think the, for me, the hardest thing is that I, is, is what I did say in the talk, which is that I think about the world as an uncertain place. And politics does not really allow you to talk about uncertainty. We talk about point estimates. Um, and that is very unnatural for me. I think about 90% confidence intervals. Um, and, um, I think basically everyone in the administration who wasn't an economist would tell me that not only does that open you up to trouble, but it bore, it's boring, boring, boring. <laughs> um, so, you know, it it's, doesn't serve any purpose. Um, but I, I think that that doesn't impact, it, it doesn't impact the advice that we give. And um, it just means that in our public engagement, we have to choose carefully questions from people like me. Uh, <laughs> let, let me just say that the problem you asserted about confidence intervals is not confined to the government. I confronted exactly the same problem in the corporate world. Nobody wanted to hear about confidence intervals. They wanted point estimates. I, I'm really glad you said that because actually I, I've had a little bit of a, I had a brief stint myself in the corporate world, and I found the exact same thing. And uh, it's actually what drove me back to academia. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, I think it's it's exactly right. It is true that you know people don't grow up comfortable with statistics, 
it would be good if more of our preschoolers were comfortable with statistics, more of our elementary school students. Um, but that, that's just not the world that, that we currently live in. And I think that that's why it isn't just about government. The, the public, the world, they want a point estimate. Thank <laughs> you.